military officials Thursday. He discussed a range of security issues, including Pyongyang and the Iran nuke deal. Trump emphasized Washington's ultimate goal, his denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and added the U.S. will do what it must to protect itself and its allies from the Hermit Kingdom's threats. The comments seem to resonate the tone set in his speech at the U.N. General Assembly, where he vowed to totally destroy North Korea if Washington was forced into action. The factories will run more actively amid speculation the regime restarted production using South Korean equipment left behind at the site. It claims other countries should not interfere with the issue as the industrial zone lies within the North's sovereign territory. The announcement follows reports of the Hermit Kingdom utilizing facilities there to produce goods like clothing. Opened back in 2004, the Joint Factory Park was home to 124 South Korean firms employing more than 54,000 North Korean workers to produce labor-intensive goods such as clothes and utensils. It was shut down by Seoul in February of 2016 in response to Pyongyang's fourth nuclear test and long-range missile launches. By the parents of Otto Warmbier, an American college student who died after being detained by the rogue state for over a year. Noteworthy political names like Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz and Sherrod Brown highlighted the broad support for the move from both sides of the aisle. Currently, only three countries fall under the U.S. list of state terrorism sponsors, Iran, Syria and Sudan. North Korea was on the list from 1988 until 2008 before it was removed by George W. Bush administration following Pyongyang's agreement to allow greater supervision of its nuclear programs. In order to be listed, the Secretary of State must review all available evidence that clearly link state activities of the country in question to international terrorism. North Korea has already drawn international rebuke for its continued nuclear and missile tests. South Korea says Pyongyang should not infringe on the property rights of South Korean companies that have been doing business at the now-closed Kaesong Industrial Complex, where most firms left behind facilities and equipment. The remarks from Seoul come after Pyongyang indicated that it may have resumed operations at Kaesong. An official from Seoul's unification ministry made clear that Seoul's stance has not changed. Pyongyang cannot act unilaterally on issues affecting the industrial complex. Those comments came in response to an op-ed posted on the North's propaganda website Uri Minjokiri that stated no one should interfere with what the regime does in the industrial park, which it called its sovereign territory. Another propaganda outlet, Meari, referenced hard-working laborers at the park and also said the industrial zone lies within North Korea's sovereign territory. While Seoul has not verified that operations are underway at the industrial zone, Radio Free Asia, citing North Korean sources in China, reported this week that the North has secretly started running 19 clothing factories at Kaesong for its domestic market as well as Chinese customers. Since Seoul announced a suspension of operations at Kaesong last February, satellite imagery has shown North Korea has run and relocated South Korean-owned buses. Being these uh, kind of hints and mm -hmm. uh, suggestions from time to time, and he seems to enjoy the befuddlement of those who were listening at uh, at what he says. And he, of course, he didn't uh, clarify. It sounds as if it's possible he's talking about some kind of military action that would, that would go against North Korea. Remember, uh, just a couple of days ago, Martha, Heather Nauert, the spokeswoman at the State Department, uh, published a tweet that I saw that said, um, you know, the North Korea will not be permitted, this is not the exact words, but this is the gist of it, yeah. will not be permitted to acquire a nuclear arsenal. Uh, either that'll, that'll either happen diplomatically or by force. The choice is up to, to North Korea. 
which I thought was pretty, pretty startling. Yeah. Uh, and you put that together with this, maybe he's hinting at something. Now remember, Martha, the, the traditional view long held by every military person I've ever talked to and anybody else who's looked into the issue is that military action, although we would unquestionably win any conflict against North Korea and possibly fairly quickly, is not a good option because of the vulnerability to Seoul, which is just a short distance from the, from the DMZ and the, and the North Korea-South Korea border, Seoul has focused upon it, not nuclear weapons necessarily, but conventional weapons, right. artillery pieces of, in such numbers that the destruction on Seoul and the loss of human life there, heavily populated area, would be so great that it is unacceptable and, and, and means that uh, military action of the kind we might contemplate is, it really can't be on the table. Now, it's possible that with weaponry of today that didn't exist before, some kind of military way of dealing with this has been devised and some plan is out there that the president was hinting at. But I don't know anything about that, and, and yeah. I haven't seen any reporting to the effect that that exists. And in this leaky city, it's hard to believe that something that dramatic could be developed in total secrecy. Mm. But there you are. Yeah, I, I had the same impression. Of course, we don't know what he meant because he didn't say. But he's standing there with military leaders and sort of dropping something like that. Um, North Korea is the first thing that, that comes to mind. Um, the only other subtext that I thought about was, you know, some sort of shakeup on his staff, whether it be, you know, at the Secretary of State position. I mean, there's been so much going well, why, flying yeah, around why you, with General. Why would with, you? Why would you link that though to a comment about, you know, the, the power um, no, of our my, military? No, my, my first pick would be North Korea. Um, yeah. uh, you know, who knows? Who knows? You know, and, who knows? And, is and right. doesn't he? And doesn't he love to keep us guessing? And he loves to keep us guessing exactly. Um, I, I want to play a little soundbite over on the Democratic side um, from Representative Sanchez talking about the leadership, and get your thoughts on it. Let's play that. I don't want to single her out. I think well, that there. Well, her, are, Steady Hoyer, Jim Clyburn, all three I, of them, perhaps. I, I, I think that it's time to pass the torch to a new generation. They are all of the same generation. And again, their contributions to the Congress and to the caucus are substantial. But I think there comes a time uh, when you need to pass that torch. And I, and I think it's time. I need a quick answer here if you can, Britt, but what do you well, think? Well, if you look at the electoral wreckage that the Democrats have experienced mm -hmm. in recent elections in the House, the Senate, the governorships, uh, and now the presidency, uh, it's completely understandable. Indeed, it seems almost inevitable that people would be looking around, casting about for new leaders. And the senior leaders of the Democratic Party are pretty old. Nancy Pelosi's way up in her 70s, and and uh, and you know their president, uh, Joe Biden, who's uh, still thinking about president, is old. Yeah. Hillary Clinton is old. So it's pr probably on their mind. In practical terms, uh, in operational terms, it's uh, very much the same as uh, President Obama's. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot more continuity than change right now, despite the fact that President Trump uh, campaigned on a platform of uh, a radically new approach to counterterrorism. He didn't give many details. It wasn't a very specific uh, uh, pledge that he made. Uh, but right now, you know, the military is essentially doing the same sort of thing it did under uh, President Obama, using, uh, using a lot of intelligence to conduct highly targeted raids. Uh, our intelligence uh, operations and our law enforcement operations are also uh, continuing along the same lines. What has changed is a lot of the rhetoric. And the President's habit of tweeting, for example, has, has not helped. Um, but uh, to date, you know, we haven't seen any of the big changes uh, that he promised during the campaign. We haven't seen uh, the reinstitution of torture, for example, of targeting terrorist families, uh, of really uh, taking the gloves off and using uh, vastly more firepower than had been used before. Um, so in that sense, uh, th there's been a lot of continuity. There are some other uh, aspects of his approach that are, are different and that will show 
uh, you know, their results further down the line, but in terms of operations, it's very much the same. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that President Trump has been kind of known for so far is uh, his unpredictability, besides the tweeting habit that uh, he seems to be continuing ex um, demonstrating. How do you think this uh, unpredictability has affected or has been translated into the work of counterterrorism? Well, very little, in fact. Um, Counterterrorism, uh, first of all, it doesn't really allow for unpredictability uh, in the same way. Uh, but what we have seen is some pretty dramatic steps that the president has taken um, that, while not exactly unpredictable, uh, will have um, effects down the line. So, for example, his embrace of uh, the uh, Saudi government, uh, which has been um, in taking, you know, we have a good relationship with, the, with Saudi Arabia, we've had it for a long time, but he has t uh, taken the Saudi side in the uh, sort of regional conflict between Sunni and Shia Muslims in a way that could actually uh, increase the amount of violence over the long term because uh, the sectarian strife is a major driver uh, of, uh, of um, sectarian, uh, of jihadist terrorism. Uh, that's uh, one area. The other area is with the very sharp rhetoric towards Pakistan. Uh, that also could have consequences uh, down the line. Uh, because uh, as one president after another has found, it's very hard to get Pakistan uh, to do uh, all that you want it to do, but it's also very hard to do counterterrorism without uh, a good relationship with Pakistan, or at least a, a working relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about uh, President Trump's uh, Afghanistan policy. While as a candidate, he denounced Afghanistan as a total disaster, and now President Trump said he will ramp up U.S. engagement in Afghanistan and uh, handily defeat terrorism there. His speech on Afghanistan troop deployment is in lockstep with the past presidents, and for people who hoped that President Trump would be a transformative president in fighting terrorism. What has he achieved so far, and how do you look at his Afghanistan uh, policy? Well, let me uh, answer what I think are two parts of uh, the question. The Afghanistan policy is another example of continuity uh, with, uh, uh, with the past policies. Uh, in fact, it's rather ambiguous in many, many of its details. Uh, he has been, uh, uh, you know, very explicit in saying that he wanted to withdraw from Afghanistan, but at the end of the day, uh, he was uh, prepared to be influenced by the military leadership uh, surrounding him. Uh, I think that's probably a good thing because I think that there are uh, lots of good developments in Afghanistan. Um, that we should not squander by uh, a hasty departure. At the same time, mm -hmm. uh, this is not a solution. This is not a uh, recipe uh, for winning uh, the war over the Taliban. I don't think that is really a winnable war, certainly not on the current uh, trajectory. But what it will do is continue to give the government there and the military there some breathing space to uh, uh, strengthen and uh, we hope embrace policies that will earn the loyalty of more of the population. Um, you spoke about you know, people who expected transformative, uh, transformative effects in counterterrorism. I think many of those people were people who are animated, that is, we're talking about American voters, people who are animated by strong anti-Muslim sentiment and uh, they certainly will be disappointed that he hasn't uh, embraced any of the really uh, somewhat outlandish proposals he made during the campaign. Uh, personally, I think that that's a good thing. A return to torture would uh, result in uh, international condemnation in the United States and would only accelerate uh, the drivers of terrorism. It would only uh, increase, I think, uh, recruitment. 
It would be bad for our moral character. It would be bad for our policies. Uh, <clears throat> I think that the president has, in a sense, um, you know, maintained the same kind of uh, wary to negative posture towards Muslims in the United States. He has not stood up, for example, when uh, people um, uh, were wondering how he would react to, the, to an attack uh, on a bus in the Pacific Northwest where uh, a right-wing radical was hectoring uh, some girls, was, was really screaming at some girls, uh, claiming that they were uh, Muslim and that they were to blame for all the country's problems. And, you know, two Americans were killed defending them. And that is something that he never really took note of. And there have been many, many attacks against mosques and against Muslims in the United States, and he's been notably silent on that. So in that regard, he continues to try to curry favor with his base. But in terms of doing the big uh, uh, transitions, the big, uh, the big turns, the new policies that uh, so many had feared, uh, they haven't really appeared yet. Well, talking about that, um, how do you look at the potential effect of him being quiet about this kind of uh, anti-Muslim uh, behavior in that country? Basically, he is allowing this kind of hatred to exist, right? Even, um, uh, you know, for instance, the kind of travel ban um, that he uh, famously defends as not being a Muslim ban. How do you think will be the consequences of this kind of measures in terms of counterterrorism? Over the long term, these are very, very negative developments. Uh, the um, key, or one of the keys to counterterrorism success for the United States at home has been the cooperation of the American uh, Muslim community, or communities as it's often called because it's so diverse. Um, that relies on the trust that Muslims living in the United States have uh, that their uh, government is there to protect them, co you know, work with them, and promote their best interests, not and not target them in any way. And uh, there's great fear um, in many different corners, you know, in the law enforcement community, and certainly among those who watch this carefully, that that trust is being eroded. The fact that the president hasn't spoken up uh, when Muslims have been the target of violent crimes is very, very disturbing. Uh, the travel ban that you mentioned uh, has been enormously disturbing and is totally and utterly counterproductive. Um, and uh, virtually the entire United States counterterrorism community uh, that is in a, in a position to uh, say anything about this travel ban, that is to say it's not actually in government service right now, has come out against it because uh, it is such a negative signal to Muslims at home, uh, to Muslims abroad, to those that we work with uh, through intelligence, with our military. Uh, this is really uh, bad news and is going to hurt us over the long run.